No. All right. Hello, Rosemary. <laughs> Hello. Um, I had to unmute my microphone. And yes, I, I was going to say something wrong there. Okay, we're all right now. <laughs> now yes, we are. So um, it's a pleasure to get to have you with us uh, this, um, I would say, should I say this afternoon? <laughs> or yes. this morning? Yeah, this afternoon <laughs> for where me. you are. Morning for yeah. you, yes. No, it, no, no I'm, I'm, I, it's afternoon for me too. Oh, right. <laughs> Oh right, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yes. I, I'm I'm in Portugal right now. Oh I see. Oh okay. <laughs> so okay. we we are on the same time zone. Yes. Um so it's a pleasure to have you. Um and thank you very much for uh receiving um uh, for, for, sorry for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure to receive you. Um and um we have been preparing this event on uh, about George Eliot and, and her work. And um, I'm going to introduce you uh, to uh, the audience. I'm, I'm actually going to summarize your uh, mini bio, which is not that many, <laughs> because you've done a lot, you've worked quite a lot, but I think perhaps uh, I'll just uh, concentrate on the main things. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Rosemary Ashton is uh, Emeritus Quain Professor of English Language and Literature at University College London, and she was born in Scotland. So, it's a pleasure to have a Scottish <laughs> <laughs> professor with us. Uh, well, um, professor Ashton studied English and German literature first at the Universities of Aberdeen and Heidelberg, and then at the University of Cam Cambridge, where she got her PhD on Anglo-German literary relations in the 19th century. But, um, well, she also lectured in uh, Birmingham at the University of Birmingham and then uh, University College London. I think perhaps the most important thing to say about um, uh, Professor Ashton's publications, um, which in fact, <laughs> there's a, a, a quite a long list here of very important books, but I think perhaps the most important thing to say is that Professor Ashton has specialized in, uh, in the work of George Eliot, and she was responsible for the Penguin edition of Middlemarch, mm -hmm. and also she is the biographer of, uh, of George, George, George Eliot. So uh, this means I think she will have a lot to tell us, a lot, a lot of contributions. And again, thanks very much for accepting our invitation. So the floor is all yours. I'm going to disappear now <laughs> and um, it will be all you know. Thanks very much, Rosemary. Thank you very much, Sandra. And thank you also to Bruno for setting up this, um, this lecture by Zoom or distance. Um, it's very nice to have been asked. I'm very grateful to have been asked to talk to you in this the 150th year since the publication of this great novel, Middlemarch. And also to celebrate uh, what I understand is a new Portuguese translation of the novel. So there's plenty to celebrate all round. And what I'm going to talk about is Middlemarch and the difficulty of coming to conclusions. Um, it's not going to be entirely about Middlemarch. I'll talk a little bit about one or two other books, including her first novel, Adam Bede. But it, I'm moving all the way in and out of Middlemarch and towards Middlemarch uh, for my main conclusion. Well, when we talk about conclusions, we mean, on the one hand, endings, of course, and on the other, judgments, including moral judgments. Sometimes a tension can exist between the two kinds of conclusion, endings and judgments. So I wish to explore this topic with reference to George Eliot's theory and practice as a novelist, building up to a discussion of how she came to conclusions in her greatest novel, Middlemarch. First of all, to start with her last work, which you may not know very well, it's not a novel. Her last published work, was called The Impressions of Theophrastus Such. It was published in 1879, the year before her death. And it's a set of short essays discussing human opinions and characteristics. Here, she often considers the position of the writer. One essay entitled The Too Ready Writer addresses the problem of the potential narrowness of any one consciousness. <laughs> 
including that of a novelist. Here she might have her own fiction in mind when she makes her sceptical narrator, Theophrastus Such, talk about the necessity of opening one's mind to a variety of beliefs, experiences and points of view. I'm quoting now, there is a monotony of narrowness already to spare in my own identity. What comes to me from without should be larger and more impartial than the judgment of any single interpreter. That's Theophrastus such. And in another essay, Shadows of the Coming Race, Theophrastus slyly considers the possibility that in the future there will be a machine for drawing the right conclusion, which will doubtless by and by be improved into an automaton for finding true premises. Joking, of course, wit uh, here uh, at, at the forefront of this remark, and I take these remarks about avoiding singleness of mind, really, in write, when writing about human nature, I take these remarks as a statement of George Eliot's scepticism about coming to conclusions in the sense of judgments. Since conclusions are also endings, as I've said, we should look a little bit at the last acts of novels, the actual final words, for example, and I'll get on to that towards the end of this lecture. Now, there's a paradox at the heart of George Eliot's efforts and achievements as a novelist. She sometimes claims through her fictional narrators that we should not judge our fellow mortals, but accept them as they are. And that's a quote from chapter 17 of Adam Bede, her first novel. But she just as often suggests the necessity of judging motives and actions. She applies a code of ethics derived from Christianity tempered by the religion of humanity she found in Spinoza and Feuerbach, and also by the wise tolerance exhibited in Goethe's works. Readers often think of her as a didactic author who lectures them about the morality of human actions, but I think that she makes use of the strong narrative voice in a more subtle way than that. Open-mindedness, generous humour, irony, scepticism, but a positive scientific kind of scepticism rather than a narrow negative cynicism which distrusts everything. So scepticism in the kind of positive sense. These open-mindedness, generous humour, irony and scepticism are the qualities her narrative voice conveys and wishes readers to share. Moreover, her narrators are willing to express uncertainty. Now, Adam Bede, the first novel by this mysterious new author, George Eliot, was an instant success with readers and critics when it was published in 1859. Readers marveled at its humour, its pathos, its believable dialogue, its representation of class differences and its successful embedding of credible characters in their provincial context. Its unusualness in all these ways was instantly recognised for the realism of its setting and the shrewd human psychology exhibited in it, its psychological realism. So realism of setting and psychological realism were the attitudes that um, and the achievements that readers noticed straight away. Now, you could test this claim. I'm not saying that Adam Bede is the best novel that came out in 1859, but you could test the claim about the realism, particularly the psychological realism, if you looked at some of the other novels which were being published at the same time. Even those novels of her already famous contemporaries, Dickens, Thackeray and Charlotte Bronte. But that's a discussion for another time. But just to point out to you that Adam Bede is different. In chapter, and I'm going to look at it a little bit. In chapter 17 of Adam Bede, entitled In Which the Story Pauses a Little, the narrator sets out a realist manifesto on the art of fiction. So he or she stands outside the text and the story to tell us about 
writing fiction. That's why I'm suggesting that it's something that you might want to look at, even if you don't read the whole of Adam Bede, you might read chapter 17, because it will tell you quite a bit about George Eliot's ideas about fiction. Well, the narrator insists on the necessity for art to represent life in all its details, ugly as well as beautiful, rich, poor as well as rich, and flawed rather than perfect. An imagined reader, my idealistic friend, who dislikes vulgar details, is tutored on the topic of the rare, precious quality of truthfulness, which is to be found, says the narrator, or says George Eliot behind the narrator, is to be found in Dutch paintings with their old women scraping carrots with their work-worn hands. Old women scraping carrots in Dutch or Flemish paintings, which you will know all about. The art of fiction should be concerned, says the narrator, with the faithful representing of commonplace things. So that's chapter 17 of Adam Bede. Now, this new novelist was brave to enter the ranks with such a theory. She was rewarded by having readers accept it completely. They were delighted to find that such faithful representation of ordinary life did not imply dullness and that realistic presentation is perfectly compatible with humour. The farmer's wife, Mrs Poyser, is a marvel of sharp colloquial sayings in her interactions with her contemporaries and her acquaintances. She, Mrs Poyser, the character Mrs Poyser, won the distinction of being quoted in Parliament for one of her witty sayings. At one point, she, there are several of them, but I pick one. At one point, she mocks an egotistical neighbour for being like a cock, which thinks that the sun has risen on purpose to hear him crow. And that's in chapter 18. Now, all George Eliot's works show that literary realism, the representation of things as they are, need not be merely a matter of seeing and describing. It's compatible also with intellectual, moral and philosophical observation and opinion. One of the best of George Eliot's contemporary critics, Leslie Stephen, father of the modernist novelist Virginia Woolf, Leslie Stephen wrote admiringly in his monograph on George Eliot. Uh, it's one of the first critical books on George Eliot. It was published in 1902. And Leslie Stephen talks about her extraordinary powers of assimilating knowledge. And he writes, it may safely be said that no novelist of Mark ever possessed a wider intellectual culture. Now, I know that, some, that sometimes George Eliot frightens people with her intellectual culture. But hold on, we've got a lot more to say about how that intellectual culture is blended with other uh, perhaps easier or more immediately attractive um, facilities and faculties in her novels. Leslie Stephen believed that the works she published after her third novel, Silas Marner, in 1861, that those after Silas Marner were spoilt to some extent by the very intellectualism he admired. In Middlemarch, he finds her philosophical and scientific language intrusive. He misses what he calls the simple charm of the earlier works. As is well known, Leslie Stevens' daughter, Virginia Woolf, helped to resurrect Middlemarch from critical neglect in an article in 1919, the centenary of George Eliot's birth. Virginia Woolf famously calls Middlemarch the magnificent book which, with all its imperfections, is one of the few English novels written for grown-up people. And that was in the Times Literary Supplement on the 20th of November, uh, 1919. I might just add here that Woolf does not identify these imperfections that she notes here. Uh, and some of us might wish her to be held to account. Well, which imperfections are you thinking of, uh, Virginia? However, she has said that the novel is one of the few novels written for grown up readers. Both Leslie Stephen and Virginia Woolf appreciate the intelligence shown in George Eliot's judgments, her art of reflecting on characters and events. For example, Leslie Stephen admired the presentation of the painful relationship between Dr Lydgate and his wife Rosamond in Middlemarch. 
Henry James also gave the, what he called the painful fireside scenes between the couple the highest praise. James wrote, there is nothing more powerfully real than these scenes in all English fiction and nothing certainly more intelligent. And this is in his review of Middlemarch in 1873. On the other hand, Stephen found George Eliot too pessimistic. He thought she was occasionally too insistent in putting forward her philosophy of life. Yet he himself had gone through much the same intellectual development as she had. Both Stephen and George Eliot, uh, Mary Ann Evans, as her real name was, um, both of them lost their evangelical religious faith in youth. They read the works of Spinoza, John Stuart Mill and Auguste Comte, for example, and became agnostics. Before turning to novel writing, George Eliot had not only read, but also translated Spinoza's Ethics and two works of German historical scholarship, David Friedrich Strauss's The Life of Jesus and Ludwig Feuerbach's Essence of, Human, of, Essence of Christianity. The latter, The Essence of Christianity, explained to her satisfaction that the Christian God is a figment of man's imagination, a necessarily perfect being against which man measures his own imperfect self, while striving to enact moral virtues in his interactions with his fellow human beings. So we human beings invent a perfect being, God, who will forgive us for when we make our not so perfect decisions um, and will watch over us in some way and help us in our lives. All George Eliot's fictional works from first to last, from Scenes of Clerical Life in 1858, three longish short stories, to Daniel Deronda, her last novel published in 1876, all these works embody imaginatively this Feuerbachian belief that the truly religious action is that of helping our fellow men and women. That's his imp most important belief for her. And we can test this because her fictional clergymen do good through human fellowship with their flock, not by quoting scripture from the pulpit. In fact, I believe we never see a George Eliot clergyman preaching in church, which is quite surprising when you think about it. And her non-clerical characters, particularly Dorothea in Middlemarch, do good by sympathising imaginatively with and acting warmly towards their acquaintances. A hard-won altruism is displayed, especially in the famous scene in chapter 81 of Middlemarch. I hope you've all got there so far. It's a wonderful uh, chapter to reach. So if you haven't got there, make way towards it as quickly as you can. So anyway, this hard-won altruism that is one in which Dorothea, despite her own misery and jealousy of Rosamond Lydgate, goes to visit Rosamond in a bid to help her in her marriage troubles. But first, the equally famous chapter 80, the one before, takes Dorothea through a long night of struggle as she thinks about the unhappy marriage between Dr Lydgate and his beautiful, narrowly egotistic uh, egotistical wife. Dorothea sympathises with both husband and wife and wants to help. But now, after having come upon Rosamond and Will Ladislaw apparently sharing a romantic moment, she feels jealous indignation and disgust since she herself has come to love Will Ladislaw. Now, she has no desire to help Rosamond, yet she forces herself, writes George Eliot, to dwell on every detail and its possible meaning. Was she alone in that scene? Was it her event only? She said to her own irremediable grief that it should make her more helpful instead of driving her back from effort. Adding imaginative illustration to the moral thinking of this passage, what was Dorothea thinking? How did she talk herself out of her desire to not to help. Adding imaginative illustration to this, the narrator then describes Dorothea opening the curtains as the sun rises after this difficult night of agony. And she sees a man with a bundle on his back and a woman carrying her baby. 
She felt, writes the narrator, the largeness of the world and the manifold wakings of men to labour and endurance. She was part of that involuntary palpitating life and could not hide her eyes in selfish complaining. So that's Middlemarch, chapter 80. Chapter 81 sees Dorothea again visiting Rosamond and finding it possible this time to offer help despite her feelings of sorrow and resentment. Surely this is a fine example of the way an imaginative work can bring moral philosophy to life can give to Airy nothing, a local habitation and a name, uh, as the poet is said to do famously in Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, Act Five. Giving to Airy nothing, a local habitation and a name. And in this case, giving to an idea, a philosophical and moral idea about overcoming jealousy, giving it an example when Dorothea can look out of the window, away from herself, and out to see life outside, which nonetheless she's a part of. And this is what literature can do, in addition to, to add to moral philosophy. Now, in his book, Leslie Stephen admires George Eliot's superb skill in setting out what he says is the sum of the moral and intellectual processes which we can all understand. She is singularly powerful in describing the conflicts of emotions, the ingenious modes of self-deception, which most of us employ. On the other hand, he thinks that there is here and there too much explicit psychological analysis, and that for all George Eliot's brilliant powers of wit, she offers a rather melancholy view of life in general. Now, this opinion about George Eliot offering a melancholy view of life is shared by many readers. But is he right? Let's take, take up some of these points. George Eliot's concern with moral and intellectual processes, her psychological analysis, her powerful descriptions of the conflicts of emotions, and what Stephen believes to be her melancholy view of life. Here is where a consideration of George Eliot's conclusions in the sense of judgments is required. Conclusions in the sense of practical endings will come in too for the particular narrative outcomes of a novel. Who marries whom? Who dies? Who loses his money? Who succeeds in her aspirations? Who has to accept a life rather less adventurous than had been hoped for? And so on. These particular narrative outcomes inevitably suggest a particular interpretation. The way the novelist chooses to end his or her novel seems to suggest an inevitability about that ending, either logically or morally. The writer seems to be offering a final judgment on the characters, to be making the choice of ending according to his or her philosophical and moral view of life. Many novelists, particularly in the 18th and early 19th centuries, choose to give prizes to good characters and punishments to the bad. In the certainty that part of the reader's pleasure is bound up in the satisfaction offered by such poetic justice. Jane Austen does this. For example, in Mansfield Park, 1814, she begins her final chapter of doling out destinies by declaring explicitly what she is about to do. Jane Austen, let other pens dwell on guilt and misery. I quit such odious subjects as soon as I can, impatient to restore everybody not greatly in fault themselves to tolerable comfort and to have done with all the rest. She proceeds to restore her heroine Fanny Price to her rightful place in the Bertram household, namely its centre, not its periphery, where Fanny has languished for the whole of the novel. Jane Austen has the head of the house, Sir Thomas Bertram, realise and rectify his mistakes with regard to Fanny. And most satisfying of all, the two nastiest characters, Mrs Norris and her niece Maria, are sent off to a remote and private place where, shut up together with little society, on one side no affection, on the other no judgment, it may be reasonably supposed that their tempers became their mutual punishment. That's Jane Austen at her witty and clever best, that the, the people's tempers can become their mutual punishment, and that's in chapter 48, the last chapter of Mansfield Park. 
Dickens, too, often, often finishes by distributing prizes and punishments. Oliver Twist is a good example. The philanthropist, Mr. Brownlow, adopts the orphan Oliver at the end, and the Bumbles become paupers in the very workhouse they once presided over with such cruelty. By contrast, George Eliot felt that as a self-styled realist, uh, she could not allow herself the luxury of always rewarding her favourites and punishing the characters of whom she disapproved. Her reasoning was straightforward. She expressed it while she was still Marian Evans, translator and journalist, a few years before she attempted fiction. In life, virtue is not always rewarded and vice punished. In literature, then, a writer is not really pointing a moral when he or she reaches for, and I'm quoting now, the so-called reaching for the so-called moral denouement in which rewards and punishments are distributed according to those notions of justice on which the novel writer would have recommended that the world should be governed if he had been consulted at the creation. The emotion of satisfaction which a reader feels when the villain of the book dies of some hideous disease or is crushed by a railway train is no more essentially moral than the satisfaction which used to be felt in whipping culprits at the cart's tail. And this is in an essay called The Moral Morality of Wilhelm Meister, uh, written in 1855, and you can find it in various selected editions of George Eliot's essays, including one that I did for Oxford University Press. Well, that is to say, George Eliot understands and to a degree shares the reader's feeling of satisfaction at such moments of poetic justice, while declining to think that such a feeling is morally admirable. When she turned to writing fiction herself, beginning with scenes of clerical life, she followed Goethe whom she praised in this article for showing in his novel Wilhelm Meister tolerance of mistakes and sympathy for mixed and erring and self-deluding humanity. In an article entitled The Natural History of German Life, 1856, shortly before she took the plunge into fiction writing, she strikes out with a manifesto. The greatest benefit we owe to the artist, whether painter, poet or novelist, she writes, is the extension of our sympathies. She goes on to claim that imaginative literature can do more than sermons and philosophical dissertations to forge links between human beings. Art is the nearest thing to life, she writes. It is a mode of amplifying experience and extending our contact with our fellow men beyond the bounds of our personal lot. So, Amplifying experience, extending our sympathies. That's what art does through the imagination, the imagination of the writer, which is met in turn by the imagination of the reader, which arouses the imagination of the reader. And that's the natural history of German life, 1856. Almost the last essay she wrote before plunging into uh, fiction is the witty Silly Novels by Lady Novelists published in October 1856. In this essay, she wittily dismisses some recently published novels with their ludicrously perfect heroines, examples of the ideal woman in feelings, faculties and flounces, as she writes. And here's a short quote from this very funny essay. Her eyes, this is the, the, the heroine, her eyes and her wit are both dazzling. Her nose and her morals are alike free from any tendency to irregularity. She has a superb contralto and a superb intellect. She is perfectly well-dressed and perfectly religious. She dances like a sylph and reads the Bible in the original tongues. In her recorded conversations, she is amazingly eloquent, and in her unrecorded conversations, amazingly witty. Here, George Eliot has fun at the expense of some really bad novels, characterised by terribly stilted dialogue and unrealistic plots. And she ends by suggesting what a novel should be. Like crystalline masses, it may take any form and yet be beautiful. We have only to pour in the right elements. Genuine observation, humour and passion. Genuine observation, humour and passion. That's what we need. <laughs>
She calls for novels to represent people of all classes and present the workaday world without falling into one of two opposite traps. One, idealizing working people, turning them into opera peasants, or two, treating them as if they belong to a different and lower species. Then she sets out to obey her own prescription for the writing of a good novel. George Eliot's novel, uh, narrators in the novels do actually tread a difficult path. They direct the reader's attention towards certain opinions and judgments. However, they do so in a spirit of openness, sometimes even of ambivalence, so that the lesson one learns is not so much that this or that opinion is the correct one, but rather that attempting to come to a judgment, a conclusion, is both necessary and difficult, and that arriving at a conclusion is in some cases impossible. In that famous chapter 17 of Adam Bede, in which the story pauses a little, the narrator turns directly to us readers, daring us to object to her portrayal of the clergyman, Mr. Irwin, as less than saintly. How much more edifying it would have been, she imagines us complaining, if you had made him give Arthur, the young man in the novel, if you'd, given, if, if you'd made him give Arthur some truly spiritual advice, you might have put into his mouth the most beautiful things, quite as good as reading a sermon. To which the narrator's robust reply, it to us as imagined, is, oh, certainly I could. If I were a clever novelist, not obliged to creep servilely after nature and fact, but able to represent things as they never have been and never will be. Then, of course, my characters would be entirely of my own choosing, and I could select the most unacceptable type of clergyman and put my own admirable opinions into his mouth on all occasions. But you must have perceived long ago that I have no such lofty vocation, and that I aspire to give no more than a faithful account of men and things as they have mirrored themselves in my mind. The mirror is doubtless defective. The outlines will sometimes be disturbed, the reflection faint or confused, but I feel as much bound to tell you as precisely as I can what that reflection is, as if I were in the witness box narrating my experience on oath. The complexity and multiplicity of tone here is striking. Though written in pseudo-apologetic language, this is actually a claim to superiority. An obvious untruth, the suggestion that she's not free to write about characters entirely of her own choosing, is cleverly put to use in the service of a greater truth, namely that the only real vocation, not the lofty one she pretends to acknowledge, the only real vocation is to give a faithful account of men and things. The playful ironies of the passage resolve themselves at the end into a serious commitment to offering truths as if on oath, while she accepts that like any witness statement, there will be inadvertent errors or omissions, since no, since no one human being can see everything whole. As so often in George Eliot's works, a single paragraph can accommodate several tonal shifts of irony and sympathy, before settling on a sometimes surprising note, either funny or serious or both. A prime example comes in the opening chapter of Middlemarch, chapter one, with the fine paragraph beginning, and how should Dorothea not marry? Here, Dorothea's marriage prospects are discussed by both narrator and lots of other characters. This paragraph, and how should Dorothea not marry, turns the reader's thoughts from criticisms of the oddities of this young woman with her Puritan energy, her strange whims, her lack of knowledge of the world, towards recognising her human potential for goodness, and at the same time criticising instead the complacent, selfish superiority of the men who might wish to marry and subdue her. This paragraph merits close attention. It's a wonderful example of what a single paragraph can do. This is how George Eliot's narrators proceed in the matter of coming to judgments or conclusions. They're strong-minded, clever, insistent sometimes, and persuasive, yet they allow for doubts and errors and gaps in knowledge. 
In fact, the predominating narrative tone is one of ambivalence, or at least the tendency to look at life from every point of view. To think in terms of paradoxes, such as the one she quotes from Aristotle's Poetics in the epigraph to a chapter of Daniel de Ronda. Aristotle writes rather smartly, it is a part of probability that many improbable things will happen. It is a part of probability that many improbable things will happen. It offers a good excuse to the writer of fiction who might be accused of writing improbable things. And George Eliot is well aware that she should be in the main probable, but that sometimes the improbable can happen, as it does, notably in Daniel de Ronda. And that uh, quotation from Aristotle comes in chapter 41 of Daniel de Ronda. It is a part of probability that many improbable things will happen. The prevailing note in George Eliot's narrators really is ironic acceptance of the difficulty of reaching conclusions. The desire to analyse, to find answers, is always in a state of tension in her novels with her recognition of this difficulty. The pervasive irony of the narrative tone allows for a kind of omniscience that is simultaneously questioning. One famous scientific analogy in Middlemarch looks at first glance like a piece of omniscience, of teaching, and, and it's from chapter 27. It's the opening of chapter 27, and it's the parable of the mirror or pier glass. And this is the, the first part of it. An eminent philosopher among my friends who can dignify even your ugly furniture by lifting it into the serene light of science has shown me this pregnant little fact. Your pier glass or extensive surface of polished steel may be made to rub by a housemaid. Will by, and made to be rubbed by a housemaid will minutely and multitudinously scratch in all directions. But place now against it a lighted candle as a centre of illumination, and lo, the scratches will seem to arrange themselves in a fine series of concentric circles round that little sun. It is demonstrable that the scratches are going everywhere impartially and it is only your candle which produces the flattering illusion of a concentric arrangement, its light falling with an exclusive optical selection. These things are a parable. The scratches are events, and the candle is the egoism of any person now absent, absent of Miss Vincy, for example. Miss Vincy being, of course, Rosamond before her marriage to Lydgate. This is elaborate and insistent, these things are a parable, but the certainty that appears to accompany the extended metaphor is partly an illusion. Science is to be respected, but what it teaches here is actually the relativity of things. The candle concentrates the scratches in a circle, but it does so by means of a flattering illusion. Rosamond Vincy's egoism is represented by the candle, but the illumination it offers is faulty. In this case, the mistake is Rosamond's entirely understandable belief that Lydgate has fallen in love with her and she with Lydgate. What follows in relation to the two of them is the complicated business of mutual sexual attraction. The narrator observes the watchful idea on Rosamond's part that she and Lydgate are as good as engaged and that he will be the perfect husband for her social aspirations. Lydgate has a counter idea, which, however, is doomed, since according to the narrator, employing another scientific metaphor, his idea lies blind and unconcerned as a jellyfish, which gets melted without knowing it. This is all in chapter 27. Science can provide a useful vocabulary, can provide a useful vocabulary to describe the situation, but it cannot resolve the problem created by the conflict between Rosamond's idea and Lydgate's. Such conflicts and the difficulty of making judgments on them occur throughout Middlemarch. Early on in chapter three, Dorothea Brooke mistakes Mr. Casaubon's gravity and humorlessness for wide learning, which she believes he will generously share with her when they marry. The narrator points out that signs are small measurable things, but interpretations are illimitable. And in girls of sweet, ardent nature, every sign is apt to conjure up wonder, hope, belief, vast as a sky, and coloured by a diffused thimbleful of matter in the shape of knowledge. 
The power of George Eliot's use of metaphor here is that it can be picked up later in the novel. So, in chapter 20, once Dorothea is actually married to her middle-aged clergyman, she finds that life with him is not vast as a sky, or full of large vistas and wide fresh air, but rather like being stuck in winding passages which seem to lead nowhere. Interpretations are illimitable, also for other characters and for narrators too. George Eliot's aim is to avoid any pretense at certainty while not falling into complete scepticism about what can be known. For that is to become morally and intellectually paralysed. Here she follows the 18th century empirical philosopher David Hume. In the conclusion to his first book, the conclusion to his first book uh, of the Treatise of Human Nature in 1739, Hume confesses that his analysis of the reasoning faculty and his discovery of the impossibility of reaching certainty about our ideas has led him into a wilderness. He's shunned by his fellow thinkers for denying their certainties. But that though he can no longer accept their arguments about reason, the soul, God, or the afterlife, nor can he consign himself to the position of absolute sceptic. Where reason fails, nature steps in and cures me of this philosophical melancholy and delirium, he writes. I dine, I play a game of backgammon, I converse and am merry with my friends. Hume is able to forget in the act of living the philosoph this philosophical impasse to which he has brought his subject. He finishes by saying that a true sceptic will be diffident of his philosophical doubts as well as of his philosophical convictions. In other words, he'll be sceptical of his own scepticism because being sceptical, being in doubt, is not in itself um, the answer, the complete answer. Don't just be sceptical and deny. It doesn't help. And that's in the conclusion of the first book of the Treatise of Human Nature. Goethe also tackled the problem in his aphorism about tätige skepsis, active scepticism. The phrase suggests that doubt must be prepared to turn itself, uh, to turn it into questioning of itself. And Thomas, Thomas Henry Huxley, uh, uh, Darwin's friend, quotes from Goethe's aphorism on tätige skepsis in his Huxley's important review of Charles Darwin's Origin of Species in the Times in 1859, when Origin of Species came out. Huxley quotes Goethe and explains that this Tadiga skepsis is doubt which so loves the truth that it neither dares rest in doubting nor extinguish itself by unjustified belief. So don't go to one extreme, unjustified belief, but don't go to the other, uh, resting in mere doubt and leaving it at that. I think this is George Eliot's position as narrator. As she observes in chapter 23 of Middlemarch, Though distrust was your only clue when negotiating the sale of a horse with a wily horse dealer, nonetheless, scepticism, as we know, can never be thoroughly applied, else life would come to a standstill. There must be an attempt at balance, in other words, at recognising both losses and gains, at offering the genuine observation she required in novels, at reaching for conclusions while accepting their elusiveness. As for conclusions in the sense of endings, George Eliot thought about these early in her career as a novelist. In 1857, when she was writing her first stories, The Three Scenes of Clerical Life, her publisher, John Blackwood, uh, John Blackwood is a favourite of mine and of every George Eliot scholar because he was an Edinburgh publisher who reacted wonderfully to all her concerns. She was a very self-doubting uh, and modest and diffident writer, needed an awful lot of coaxing and persuading and praise. And John Blackwood, in his letters to her, always hit the right tone. So John Blackwood is a, a hero. Now, John Blackwood, writing to the other hero in George Eliot's life, her life's partner, George Henry Lewis, Blackwood like complained mildly about scenes of clerical life that George Eliot huddles up the conclusion of his stories too much. At this point, it's interesting to note, this is back in 1857. At this point, Blackwood did not know the identity 
or the gender of the George Eliot he was about to introduce to the world. George Eliot himself replied the following day saying, I will pay attention to your caution about the danger of huddling up my stories and adding, conclusions are the weak point of most authors, but some of the fault lies in the very nature of a conclusion, which is at best a negation. This is in the George Eliot letters, um, and it's from 1857. So she's writing there that conclusions are difficult, um, and at best a negation. I think that's quite interesting. And I suppose that she meant that in putting a stop to the lives of her imagined figures, she necessarily put an end also to any new hopes or plans or love affairs they might have or they might have found if they had carried on. Like so many authors, including those she chastised for giving out prizes and punishments, she often added a sneaky epilogue or finale in which she gives the reader a privileged glimpse of the afterlives of her characters. She can do this in all the novels apart from Daniel Deronda um, because it's the only novel which isn't set back in time. So all her novels are to some extent historical novels. So she can, without um, making us feel that it's too improbable, she can give us a sort of idea of what happened after the story proper. However, unlike other novelists who do this regularly, she strove for realism, for probability in her summings up. Many readers of Middlemarch as it was coming out in bi-monthly parts, every two months a large part of it would come out during 1871 and 1872, many readers as it was coming out wished for her two main protagonists, the admirable but flawed idealists Dorothea Casaubon and Tertius Lydgate, both unhappily married. Many people wanted them to come together in a happy ending of second chances. I think new readers today, test it yourselves, new readers today also feel that that would be a, a very nice outcome to the novel. But George Eliot wouldn't give in, give in to the temptation. Dorothea is given a second chance at marital happiness after the death of, Dr. Cas of Mr. Casaubon, but with Will Ladislaw, not with Lydgate. It's interesting, I think, as a reader of Middlemarch to ask oneself the question, how is it that George Eliot manages to reward her heroine, as Jane Austen always did hers, while insisting that in life virtue is not always rewarded nor vice punished? And yet we don't object in Dorothea's case. Could it be in part because Dorothea is seen to suffer and to overcome her jealous feelings before she is rewarded? And also in part because if realism is what's required, then it is clear that in life outside novels, some good people do gain happiness, so why not also in some novels? As for Lydgate, he gets no second chance, but is doomed to carry on faithfully with Rosamond, dropping his early hopes of become a becoming a pioneer in medical, medical research. I think, though, that this is not because George Eliot disapproves of Lydgate. Far from it. She sees his faults and she sees his mistakes, but she's very much on his side. And yet in his case, she feels she can't um, offer him the, the second chance because probability would suggest that in some cases it's not possible. In, so she's doing a different thing from the thing that Jane Austen or Dickens tends to do, um, reward the, the virtuous and punish the vicious. Even Dorothea, though George Eliot grants her a happy married future, is described in the finale in terms which are not exactly optimistic. Many who knew her, writes the narrator, thought it a pity that so substantive and rare a creature should have been absorbed into the life of another and be known only in a certain circle as a wife and mother. This is the kind of remark that Leslie Stephen had in mind when he wrote of George Eliot's rather melancholy view of life in general. But we should note that it is given as the view of many who knew her, not necessarily as the narrator's own opinion. And the final paragraph of the novel takes a balanced view of Dorothea's contribution to humanity. Reflecting the influence of Feuerbach and Spinoza with their philosophies of sympathy, the narrator achieves even-handedness through seesawing between positives and negatives until she settles on what we might term a not unhappy judgment in relation to Dorothea. The very last sentences of the novel read as follows. 
Her finely touched spirit had still its fine issues, though they were not widely visible. Her full nature, like that river of which Cyrus broke the strength, spent itself in channels which had no great name on earth. But the effect of her being on those around her was incalculably diffusive. For the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts. And that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. Negatives, not widely visible, spent itself, no great name, unhistoric acts, hidden life, unvisited tombs. Such negatives alternate with positives. Finely touched spirit, fine issues, full nature, the growing good of the world lived faithfully. And also with words and phrases which are ambivalent, half negative, half positive. Had still, but the effect, incalculably diffusive, partly dependent, that things are not so ill with you and me, half owing. This philosophical outlook is neither pessimistic nor optimistic though George Eliot certainly might have been more optimistic without sacrificing realism altogether. She could have let Dorothea and Lydgate come together and encourage one another in their philanthropic projects, or if that would be too romantic and idealised, then Lydgate could have been persuaded to stay on in Middlemarch and cooperate with Dorothea over the fever hospital she was financing and he attempting to manage. That at least is what we readers sometimes feel. George Eliot herself described her philosophy of life as meliorism, the belief that the world is neither the best nor the worst of all possible worlds, but that it may be improved up to a point or and suffering alleviated, at least in part, by human effort. And this is, she writes about this belief in meliorism in a letter of 1877, but you'll also find it if you look up meliorism in the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, she is credited as the first user of that term, halfway between pessimism and optimism. Her response, for example, to reading Darwin's Origin of Species when it came out in November 1859 had been thoughtful in this respect. Also in a letter she had said then, so the world gets on step by step towards brave clearness and honesty. But to me, the development theory and all other explanations of processes by which things came to be produce a feeble impression compared with the mystery that lies under the processes. The very novelist who seems at first glance to wish to offer explanations of processes, of human motivation and historical phenomena, this novelist is equally keen to give due place to the mystery of human relations and outcomes. Along with many of her characters, she constantly reaches for conclusions, but she recognises that they may not always be clear and may even lie sometimes beyond her reach. Though she was sometimes ponderous in her intellectual explanations of this phenomenon, her great triumph was actually, I think, an artistic one. She embodied her ideas by creating utterly believable men and women living ordinary, extraordinary lives. She practiced what she preached, pouring into her novels the ingredients she had prescribed in silly novels by leading novelists, namely genuine observation, humor and passion, as well as attempting judgments while recognizing the difficulties in doing so. Finally, it's possible to narrow down a study of conclusions to one of last words or last sentences or last paragraphs. And I won't go into it, but some of the novels are a little quiet. The endings are rather quiet, if not dull. Um, and, and they offer an insight into the problems that she knew accompanied final words as did also her contemporary novelists, Dickens, Thackeray and Charlotte Bronte, as is clear from the problematic endings of Great Expectations, Vanity Fair and Villette, respectively. You might want to go, go and look, look back at the endings of those novels uh, and think, hmm, not always satisfactory. And also, in some cases, um, the writers, as in Great Expectations, the writers had difficulty, and we know about it, in coming to the conclusion. Now, some of the epilogues to George Eliot's novels conclude with a short piece of speech by one of the characters. Um, 
These tend to be rather anticlimactic, perhaps because George Eliot's going beyond the action and drama of the story proper. She's giving us the, the afterlife glimpse. She concentrates on avoiding melodrama and instead chooses a quiet depiction of ongoing everyday life. Adam Bede is typical here. The epilogue ends with Dinah, married to Adam and the mother of two young children, addressing him when he comes home from work. Come in, Adam, and rest. It has been a hard day for thee. It's a rather flat ending, although gentle and appropriate in many ways. But I think we can see, if we look at her endings, that she did find it difficult, but what she tended to do was to try to keep her endings um, reasonable, not excitable. Middlemarch, meanwhile, has the longest, most reflective philosophical finale of all the novels. As we've seen, I quoted it, as we've seen, it embodies the meliorist view of life embraced by its author. We know that George Eliot had difficulties coming to her conclusion here. She made various changes to the text in order to strike the right meliorist note. We've already looked at the marvellous final paragraph she decided on, seeing how it holds the pros and cons of Dorothea's life in precarious but perfect balance. While in one sense all conclusions are, like Samuel Johnson's to his philosophical fiction Rasselas, published in 1759, a whole century before George Eliot started, some conclusions, like Johnson's, are a conclusion in which nothing is concluded. That's the final chapter of Rasselas, a conclusion in which nothing is concluded. So in one sense, that is true. But at the same time, George Eliot's conclusion to Middlemarch makes a safe, and to some of us readers at least, a satisfactory, a satisfactory landing just this side of pessimism. Thank you. Uh... Rosemary, thank you very, very much for such a beautiful presentation with so much uh, for us to think about. And I think for those uh, who are perhaps less familiar with uh, George Eliot's work, I mean, you've given them so much. It's, it's great. I don't really have questions, but I would just like to make a few comments, if you don't mind. Sure. Although we do have two questions from uh, the people at, uh, attending, listening to you now. Okay. Uh, no, one of the, you, you talked about how um, how Virginia Woolf talks about uh, yes. George Eliot, right? And then uh, it's interesting because you no, know, uh, I, I think you must be familiar with uh, Franco Moretti's work. Yes, and uh, and he he's the one who also says that uh, she is the only real realist uh, novelist yes. in, in, yes. in yes. the English yes. tradition. Yes. Um, which, in a way, in a way, repeats the uh, the idea that Virginia Woolf had already uh, put forward, um, and I think that perhaps what you said uh, gives a lot of evidence to why both Virginia Woolf and Franco Moretti um, can perhaps um, manifest those uh, value judgments or literary judgments about yes. her work yes. in the first place. Uh, also, I think uh, there's, this is just a general comment. Things that mm, I, you know sure. occurred to me while you were you were talking, mm -hmm. and uh, the second thing is, um, I think what you what you presented um, also, in a way, uh, make us understand perhaps much more clearly all the interventions on the part of the narrator in her work, because yes. um, you tend to think that you know third person. Uh, Omniscient narrators should not really intervene, and they should not. They should sort of stand out and let the story uh, sort of uh, move on by itself, and the characters show themselves and all that. And and, and the uh, omniscient narrators just there, sort of in a way, um, putting everything together. But as she has the omniscient narrator, and at the same time, yes. all those sort of comments and and uh, and. Um, and opinions and uh, judgments, as you said, and uh, um, and maybe what you said about her uh, uh, meliorism has to do with the fact that you know both Virginia Woolf and Moretti thought of her as you know the real thing, the realistic, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> novelist. Because I mean, that's what life is like, as you said. 
Some people are rewarded, some people are punished, some people yes. who are punished do not deserve punishment. Yes. Some yes. people who are virtuous do not get any rewards and uh, you feel sorry for them, even yes. though they, they did yes. their best. So it's really interesting how, I mean, what a great uh, novelist she is, even mainly compared to Dickens. I mean, the, I mean, I love it as well, but I mean, he sounds so much more naive, and and she seems to be so much more knowledgeable. Yes, about, of course, know, the people who would prefer Dickens to George Eliot, let's say, or the people who find yeah. George Eliot perhaps too insistent, as, as sometimes it, it does seem to be the case. I think they would say, well, well, she may be correct in her conclusions about life. Mm -hmm. But when in literature, in literature, we perhaps want to, we want the virtuous to be rewarded and we want to, and there is, of course, there's some truth in that, but she takes that into account because she uses that. She yes. talks about it and she gives examples of it and she then, you know, she then says, but it can't always happen. And so she has it, I think, she she looks from a sort of wider point of view, which is what she, exactly. is a part of her manifesto, so she can see what we readers and what writers like Dickens uh, um, offer us, well, she, yeah. she can see that that's valuable and it's, it's an escape or it's aesthetic or it's amusing or it pleases us in some way. It takes us out of our, the horrors of our lives, let's say. But she actually manages, I think she does both, you see. I think she can give us both that, that, that sense of, gosh, we really are in a, in a literary imagined world. And yet she's got the finger on the pulse of the of life outside at the same time that that's yeah. my view but i, no, I no, can't no. understand why a lot of people well i can't really understand why they prefer dickens although i i think he's a wonderful writer but you know obviously you and i think george Eliot is pretty 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 good <laughs> Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it has to do. I, I also I I love Dickens, of course. I mean, there's, <laughs> but I mean, it would. It, what strikes me as absolutely wonderful is to have this woman, right, in the nineteenth century, yes, yes. who has to hide behind a male uh, pseudonym. Yes. And uh, in a way, because this is what she had to do. And how much she—I mean, how much how how much she knows about things and in, in all, all the uh, all yes. the philosophy and the German thinkers and all yes. that. I mean, this would this was something which was really really new. I think that's true. And I think I mean, in addition to that, well, first of all, I'm sure you know. I don't know how many of of, of the people who are listening to the lecture or who are reading George Eliot know that it isn't simply the case that she uh, took a male pseudonym because all female writers had to do that. They didn't. Mrs. Gaskell wrote no, as Mrs. No, they Gaskell, didn't. No, and they even didn't. Jane Austen earlier in the century yeah. wrote as a lady. But it's because of her relationship with J.H. Lewis. He was a married yes. man with children, and he couldn't get a divorce, and so she lived with him, and she did not wish to uh, her novels to be reviewed or criticised um, uh, with pe by people thinking, oh, this is this woman, you know, blah, blah, and so on. So that was the main reason. The other reason, actually, is her genuine shyness and diffidence about her own ability. G.H. Um, Lewis writes again to John Blackwood about this, says, you know, she's she thinks when she was writing Middlemarch, she had difficulties. She had difficulties with all her novels and she she had pro domestic problems, the death of her stepson and various things going wrong and two stories that she started and couldn't finish. And then she had the brilliant idea. She didn't think it was brilliant, but we do, of putting the two stories together, which are the two stories that become the story of Lydgate and Middlemarch and the Dorothea Brook story of mm -hmm. the rather more aristocratic group. And so she puts together the Miss Brooke story with the Middlemarch, with the, the new doctor coming into Middlemarch, the Lydgate story. She puts those together and it's absolutely brilliant, but she didn't think so. And Lewis is writing, her wonderful um, husband, Lewis, is writing to Blackwood up in Edinburgh. Um, she, please, please, when you see the next instalment, Please be sure that you give it plenty of praise because she believes that this is rinsings of the cask. 
<laughs> meaning, you know, the wine barrel, which has got to the bottom and she's at the dregs. Imagine her thinking that as she was writing Middlemarch. So these are the reasons why she you know, she chose to write yeah. uh, with a male student. Specific yeah, reasons to her. Yeah, no, yeah, no, absolutely. But, you know, the thing is that there's, there's no, um, in spite of the fact that th there were those women taking, sort of actually uh, publishing under their own real names. Yes. Uh, I mean, the whole intellectual uh, environment was not really pro women novels. No, 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 right? of course not. Of course not. That's right. Yeah. And she couldn't, I mean, she couldn't join any of the professions. She couldn't be a, she could exactly. be a school teacher, but she couldn't be a university, a university exactly. professor or any of those things. Um, of course she couldn't. Um, but I think, I think some of those scenes, I mean, not, I mean, because she could read, she could read about everything and she did. So she had a man's, if you like, a man's brain when she was mm -hmm. reading. And she chose to read the things that men read at university, for example. Exactly. Although yeah. she did it on her own. But also, I think almost more amazing are those scenes in the novel which take place committee meetings. Now, you and I know all about committee meetings and how there's always a, um, there's a kind of ethos and there's a kind of character and, and people together in a room, uh, strange things happen and it's extraordinarily interesting as a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Now, she never attended a meeting. She wasn't a professional person, mm -hmm. but she gives us with those meetings of all the men in Middlemarch discussing the hospital, Lydgate's hospital, and what's going to happen. And there are some people saying, yes, we'll have a fever hospital. These are the reasons. Other people saying, no, she's brilliant at that. Yes. Now, you know, she's just extraordinary how she yeah, can do, yeah. you know, things that she could, had never actually experienced, but somehow, obviously from talking to Lewis and from reading, she. but, but, but to be able to do that kind of thing, to give you... Uh, meetings, you know, in all their boringness, but it's very interesting how she does it. That, yeah. That's a sideline, but I've always no, no, that that absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. No, before before I ask you the two questions, yeah. can I ask sure. you a sort of a side question? Yes. Uh, would you would you like to comment a little bit? I I think this is amazing. You mentioned it. I was going to ask about it, but you mentioned yes. it. You know, by chance, the yes. uh, the essay. Uh, um, oh God. I had forgotten the full title, so I just wrote here Silly Novels. Silly but Novels by Lady Novelists. Novelists. Yes, that's yes. right. Yes, could you comment a bit on that? Because, I mean, she was also sort of, in a way, discussing the kind, yes. you know, the, the, the status of the novel. As It was not only on the, uh, as you said, in, in Chapter 17 in Adam yes. B, but she was also discussing the status of the novel in those days and how uh, the novel, in a way, was also... Not, didn't have a very high status at the time, right? It, it well, took a long time. Well, it's not quite that. I don't. I mean, I think because, of course, Dickens was riding very high uh, in public opinion, and Thackeray to a lesser extent. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, they were both established by the time she gets started. And when she's writing silly novels by a lady novelist, she actually chooses. It's quite interesting. She chooses not to write about novel bad novels generally she takes novels by women which is a pity you might think um you know but but she's doing it i think she's doing it because she knows uh, she, she obviously has been thinking about the way to write novels clearly and she has reviewed i mean she's reviewed other novels by dickens and so on she's quite a, a seasoned critic and reviewer by this time mm -hmm. And this is all before she starts trying to write a novel. So she knows very well, she knows that Dickens is often uh, to be blamed for various faults uh, and so on. But she, she chooses the faults of um, lady novelists uh, because they always have a heroine, you see. And because they deal, I think it's because she feels that women... She makes an exception of Charlotte Bronte, for example, and the Bronte sisters. They are not part of this at all. She picks on some genuine novels written by women um, at that time, which are very much uh, just about the w female domestic sphere, because mm -hmm. that's what women know about. And I think George Eliot feels that um, that's not enough. It's not enough. Um, and also she picks on bad novels. There's no doubt about it. She could have picked on a lot of bad novels by men, but she mm -hmm. wants to do it because I think she wants to enter the field of writing novels, uh, doing it 
realistically what she really thinks about these bad novels which i haven't read but she in the it's rather a long article and it has long quotations extraordinary quotations one of them i remember by some women whom we've never heard of but um has some five-year-old child give a speech which could have been given by a a 60 year old clergyman i mean it's ridiculous <laughs> and so she picks on the ridiculous but i think she she's not it does seem unfortunate that she's choosing women but i think it's because of the narrowness of approach that they necessarily have but yes. she's not going to have that narrowness of approach. Right. And, and, and 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 you know and there were lots of silly novels by oh, yes. women yes. novelists. So we yes. have to grant her that. We have to, we have to. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so she, I, could I, equally, she could equally have written about very bad novels yes, by men. Yes, I don't blame her. Well, I don't blame I, her. That reminds me that um, I, I used to, when I was teaching at, at University College London, I used to do, we used to do practical critical uh, seminars where the student was just given an extract of something um, with no name, uh, no, no author, it's just an extract. And I try doing an extract of silly novels because it's very very funny and very clever and it shows you the examples of the way she can begin a paragraph apparently going in one direction and by the end of it she's gone in a completely different one and you can analyze it. it's good for analyzing in an hour and a half which is what we used to do in these seminars and i had to stop doing it because um the students were outraged at the anti-feminism of it. <laughs> I thought, oh no, this won't do. It, we just have to leave it because uh, it's too long to explain, uh, you know, how it comes about that a yes. woman is writing this. And it's not that she's anti-women, it's that she's got a specific thing in mind that she wants to sort out. So I had to stop doing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a question about, um, you know, oh, right. which touches yes. on gender, so to speak. So right, right. it's a okay. question, uh, uh, by Monica da Costa uh -huh. and the question I'm just going to read it I yes. was wondering do you believe her position as an author towards sympathetic engagement with her characters is in any way related to the rather problematic view of gender we find in her essays Ah, <laughs> well you see Monica um, that's a very interesting question and very well expressed um but i don't think i agree with you about a problem at the problem i mean what i just said would suggest i don't agree with you about a problematic attitude because i think of course it looks as if she's um picking well she is picking on women but it's for a particular purpose and it doesn't mean that she couldn't or wouldn't or didn't ever pick as it were on male authors she had plenty to say she had quite a lot to say about dickens and in fact the bit that i quoted from well, the other essay um the morality of wilhelm meister essay i think i'm now forgetting which essay but the one i quoted about where she says that it's not necessarily moral to take pleasure in um the punishing of the vil the villain either the villain who dies um is in a or in a train crash remember the dies of a de dreadful disease or is is killed in a train crash now um dickens had just a year or two before that published Dombey and Son, in which Mr. Yes. Carker, the villain of the piece, is killed in a train crash. And yes. I think, you know, she's not saying here, Mr. Dickens, you're being melodramatic and so on, but she's just got that in mind. So I don't think there, I genuinely don't think there is in George Eliot a kind of attitude of um, anti either gender, actually. But when she sees something that she wants to, um, point out the difficulties of she'll do it and of course in this case she puts she picks the silly novels by lady novelists as i said it's a shame in a way because it doesn't work now for us in our generation uh, my students my female students in particular don't like to see uh, somebody picking on women but i say it's one essay among many and it's one set of circumstances and you know and i don't mind it no, it, no, and you're, you're right. I mean, you have to contextualize it so that yes. you can understand why uh, yes. it's been put in those terms, right? Yes, yes. 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 So uh, there's another question here by, uh, I'm not sure I'm reading uh, his name correctly. It's, it's Mikael, or I think it's Mikael Frota. Okay. 
So the yes. question is uh, whether you think there's any influence of Austin on Elliot's work, because uh, once yes. you mentioned... Yes, yes. Austin, well, that's, so... that's another good question. And I think undoubtedly there is, um, because I think what Johnny, Jane Austen shares with George Eliot, or put it the other way, George Eliot shares or in a way learnt from, uh, from Jane Austen is the ironic... Uh, narrator's, narrator's voice. I mean, Jane Austen is extraordinarily uh, good at that. Um, but she's not ironic in the way that, for example, um, uh, Henry Fielding in the 18th century, or Thackeray obviously is. Uh, they're satirists, whereas Jane Austen is, uh, there's something more subtle about her. Um, she's obviously criticising, but she does it in a rather subtle, quiet way. Um, and I think George Eliot appreciate. I know she appreciated that. We have some remarks uh, from in her letters and so on, on on Jane Austen. She does admire Jane Austen very much. Um, and also, of course, Jane Austen deals with ordinary people actually um but what jane austen doesn't do that george Eliot does not that george Eliot attacks her for this but she doesn't try to imagine what it would be like to be a man in a meeting she never tries to imagine what it would be like to be a man in fact whereas george Eliot very much imagines what it would be like to be Lydgate, even mr kasobon even the, and she does you see jane austen i think is much more inclined to um, take the imaginative part of her heroine, which we love, we all love it. Men and women readers love Jane Austen. She's the, the most popular uh, Victorian, or not, not Victorian, but 19th century uh, writer in this country, I think. Uh, and of course we have endless films and television um, adaptations, Here more than we have of, J of George Eliot, because Jane Austen is I mean, you just know where she is. You know, she's got her heroines. She puts them through their difficulties, but she brings them out the other end and she's on their side. Uh, George Eliot is, is doing something more difficult, I think. She is showing that she can be on the side of different people. Men, women, old, young, this person who's in dispute with that person, but George Eliot can at least see um, the, the point of view of more than one. And that was really part of her manifesto that I indicated to you that you get in Adam Bede and in her essays, that her manifesto really was that you should try, the writer should try to see things uh, in the round and to have more than one narrow point of view. I think we're all very happy with Jane Austen's point of view because it's clever and it's witty, but it is the one point of view. And I think George Eliot goes beyond that. Well, there's one more question here, and, that, and the, the question, um, Bruno wants to ask a question, and he said he's too ashamed to do that, and then I'm going to do it for him, okay? Oh, no, said, no, 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 yes, I please. think he should, he should show his face, yeah. right? And, yes, and, and, and of course. Of course. So of the, course. I'll, I'll ask the question, and then he, so, come on, sure. Bruno, show your sure. face. <laughs> So uh, he wonders whether Emily Dickinson also suffered any inf influence from um, uh, Eliot's prose and uh, mm -hmm. Eliot's um, appreciation of small things. Do you know, that is a really good question, and it's one to which I don't know the answer. <laughs> um, I've read some Emily Dickinson, of course, but I'm not an expert on her, and I don't know, does, does this questioner know uh, has do we know what Emily is, has, does Emily Dickinson say much about George Eliot in her letters or anywhere? We don't know. You have to answer that question because I'm not a poetry person myself. No, so, no, no, I'm, no, I'm asking Bruno. I'm asking Bruno. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm asking Bruno. Bruno no, should. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> I don't know. Um, we. <laughs> Bruno, where are you? <laughs> he's, he's hiding. He's hiding. Yes. Yes. He's too ashamed to show his face. I well, listen, take, take note, please. Here am I. I'm supposed to be the great expert on George Eliot. I, I think I am. But there are things I don't know. <laughs> and I don't happen to know the answer to that question, I'm afraid. But because right. in order to answer that question, you would have to know Emily Dickinson too, which sometimes I'll have you to know her right? better than I do. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. 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 So, but I would you know. be interested. I'd be interested to know from somebody um, if Emily Dickinson did have things to say about Georgie in it. Then I would want to read them. <laughs>
<laughs> so maybe maybe then Bruno can sort of uh, go on and uh, keep on uh, corresponding with yes, you and exchanging emails and then you can sort of perhaps sort that out. <laughs> yes. Well, so, I'm happy to do that. Yes, yes. So I'm the happy enigma, to do that. he may have something because, I mean, if he's asking the question. Oh, he's got a reason. He know. has a reason yeah. for asking the question. I'm That's sure. right. Yeah. I'm yes. sure. <laughs> well, anyway, thanks very, very much for your time, for your wonderful presentation. It's been a pleasure to get to know you. In person, you know, there's in person. I so know, I know. Yes, yes. Well, thank it, you. And uh, I've enjoyed doing it. And I, I enjoy talking at any time and, you know, listening to what other people have to say as well. So thank you very much for your contribution. And if you, if, if you like to talk about George Eliot, we are going to invite you again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fine. I don't mind. Yes. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Very I've much enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.